I never, ever, 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 ever want to go back to McDonald's. Ever. Did you get the, you got the, you got the Travis Scott? Straight up. I did. I did. Was it? Uh, it tasted like McDonald's. It was mediocre. You know what? Here, 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 here's my thing about it. Like, what, for people that have posted the Travis Scott meal wasn't what I was expecting, I just have to wonder, what were you expecting? Like, it's a McDonald's, it's a McDonald's burger. Like, yes. I expect, but burger, bacon, Sprite. Did y'all think the Sprite was going to be, like, extra crispy? It was. Well, it, it was a McDonald's, McDonald's Sprite. It was extra crispy. But no, I'm thinking, like, all right, so it's like this. This is what it is. This is what most people are thinking. You want to hear it, here it is. Okay, there is a new burger at McDonald's called, like, the, or the new meal for Travis Scott, right? It's just, like, the whole meal is just a bunch of shit they already had. It's literally, like, me going to Papa Do's and being like, yo, that pop it up platter is the Avery platter. Like, no, it's the same thing. There's you know what no I, difference. You know what Travis should have done? And I feel like this would have helped out a lot of people that are, because they're like, oh, it was just McDonald's. And you win, it was just McDonald's. Travis should have gone to Arby's because nobody knows what that tastes like. So <laughs> then they'd be like, oh, you can say Arby's number one. And people were like, yo, I've never had this. I've never had, I don't know what Arby's serves. I don't know. It's like roast beef and... Wow. Um, I know there are Arby's lovers out there because every time I disparage Arby's, they come out the woodworks like they like, yo, I love Arby's. And I'm like, oh, my bad. I, you know, I ain't know. Well, you got friends that like Arby's? I, I found, uh, let's not call them friends. I okay. found people. I have said, I have made, I have insulted Arby's a number of times. And if Arby's, if you're out there listening and you want to sponsor, I have no shame. I'll turn around and whatever it is that you serve. Like, I don't know. Uh, I feel like there's au jus. Like, I, I don't know what it is. Wow. <laughs> there's some au jus there. Whole point oh, is, I was like, yeah, I'll be up there, Arby's. So, yeah. Yeah. No. Nah. I think they got mac and cheese. I said, I think. I don't I, know. You know. I haven't hey. been to Arby's since, like, the 90s. Hey. Hey, you know, I, Arby's, Long John Silver's, all they're, they're all the classics there. Oh, shit, there was a lot. Wow. There was. Arby's. Did they survive the COVIDness? I don't know. I feel like they had to. I feel like they had to because there are certain, if they survived the 80s and the 90s, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think they're fine. Yeah, I think they're fine. Nice I think they're fine. That was a nice <laughs> little, you know, we got, we got up here and we started, you know, to, oh, wait, before, because I was just going to say we started talking about food. I was just saying, we never talk about current events. I broke the rule a couple of weeks ago. I said, yo, I really hope the Rockets do well. Uh, if you watch that episode and now you're watching, I got my Rockets gear on right now. We didn't, but I knew that was going to happen. That's cool. I like to apologize first and foremost for lying to all of y'all and acting like we were going to go. I knew in my heart it wasn't going to happen, but it's like your child. Like if your child is playing in a game and you know that he's not like, and I'm not going to say he's not good. He's just not as good as the other team. You know what I'm saying? It's like we showed up with our regular like Pee Wee League kids and then we looked across the way and it was like LeBron and AD. And I was like, yo, this is eighth grade basketball. Why mm -hmm. do y'all have seniors over there? And they was like, nah, here are their birth certificates. And then they started dunking. So, you know, it, yeah. it, it, it happens. I'm still rocking with the Rockets. I'm still rocking with the Texans. In, I'm not rocking with the NFL, really, but, you know, I'm here with certain Texans players. I still rock with the Dash. If you're a Houston team, I'm with you, whether you're winning or losing. I need to get more Dash gear because they at least know how to win. They do. <laughs> so, they yeah. do. It is what it is. And that analogy you brought up about families being at games, supporting their kid, that's what it was like when we used to go to your football games. That's what we do. Black families, black and ugly as ever. However, I stay Houston down to my socks. It's one of your hosts for the In My Humble Opinion podcast. I'm Avery, like a very nice guy. Ding, also known as Avery Zaddius. Why Zaddius? Because you can call me Zaddy for short. Oh my God, it's a joke set up. And there's my brother with us, my blood brother. Yes, just Devon. Yeah, that's Boom. Me. That's me. All right. That's Devon. <laughs> Being all quiet over there. Oh, my and, bad. I was like, yeah, that's me. That's me. I'm just Devon. That, that, that's pretty much it. You got a show. You could. Yeah. 
I have mind. a show. We're anyway. working. My bad. My bad. I should have said more. I'm just Devon. I be doing stuff. Sometimes I write. There you go. I root for bad ding, teams. Ding, ding. <laughs> yes. All right. And today we have one of, a special guest with us today. All right, a Houstonian, a native Houstonian, chef, blogger, food consultant, style and media designer, and also creator. A big Game of Thrones fans, boo. Creator of the Yum Crumbs. Okay, yes. I love that. <laughs> the Fat Girl Food Chronicles, Chef Vicky V. Hey, Hi. how's it going? Let's do It's dish. going good. Let's do It's dish, going well. Yeah. Nice to meet you guys, too. It's like that intro was like lit. Yeah. Like, he does a yeah. Job on the I do have, I think I'm not y'all's people because A, I love Arby's way better than McDonald's. Well, okay, okay, wait, yeah. wait. Because you're an, I was, you, you're a food blogger. So you know I about guess. some of this stuff. So please tell us. What is it about I think, Arby's? I love Arby's because, okay, for me, just in general, I think they're the only fast food restaurant in Houston that serves cheese sticks. So that's a plus in my book always. Makes sense. You know what I'm saying? Okay. I love okay. the cheese stick. And so it's if fast food cheese sticks. I mean, if, I mean, it's not like gourmet cheese sticks. Like, you, where you get those at? So if I'm getting I, yeah, a cheese I'm not, stick, I'm not I'm, expecting gourmet. I'm not expecting no, gourmet. I just don't never. know what RB serves. I know they have the meats. They do. Crazy. I I don't even get the roast beef. So maybe I don't like Arby's, but I really <laughs> I get, get like though? they have like this deli chicken salad. All right, that. I'm not making a good. Um, I'm definitely not. You know, I'm gonna tell you right meat. now. And if there are Arby's people out there that can defend Arby's better, <laughs> I welcome it because every time an Arby's person tells me about <laughs> Arby's, it's like a McDonald's person. Like you like McDonald's? I'm like, yeah, man. I really love like they got an apple pie there that's like great. And I'm like, nah, all the food they, that's what you name is the curly fries. Okay, the curly fries. Jack in the Box got curly fries, though. Is, are they comparable? They're definitely comparable. Okay. Well, All I'm saying is, I can get cheese sticks from, uh, what is that, Checkers, Rallies, and curly and seasoned fries. I'm but good. those aren't as accessible. I guess it depends on what I was about to say, is. where is the Checkers? Well, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> right down the street from you, my guy. Right <laughs> down the street. Oh, you're right. Yeah. I never go down that. You're right. I never right. go there down there either. Go but still, I don't go okay. to Arby's either. So you're right. Oh. you're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, but if I had to choose, I'm definitely choosing. You know what? Maybe I shouldn't have said nothing because I guess pound for pound, if I had to choose something, I might choose McDonald's. But I'm definitely not rocking with this whole Travis Scott thing, like you said, because it's just it's whack. <laughs> like, yeah. Hey, look, man. Travis Scott knows how to throw his name on stuff and get people to buy hey, stuff man. that is already in existence. Like it, that's it's nuts. Like honestly, the thing that threw me is I'm like, okay, well, you got what is it? A double quarter pounder with like no. uh, bacon? A single Just quarter pounder. Single quarter pounder. It's not even bacon. double. Straight no. up one. It is a single quarter pounder. American uh, bacon. Lettuce. There's no tomato. There's no tomato. There's no tomato? There's no tomato. It's even whacker. But what really got me to be like, you know what, this is propaganda at its finest, was when they're like, don't forget the uh, barbecue dipping sauce for your fries. What? Mm. I was like, is that the selling point of all yeah, of this? Because they never had me on nothing else. That was. That, I, that I was think they were trying point. to sell that to, to like white middle America, like black people have not just been like, Dipping barbecue sauce. I mean, dipping the fries and barbecue sauce. That's like, oh, like that. Yeah, that's Tuesday. Like whatever. Yeah, you know? I was just like, this is so wet. But I mean, you know what? If it's selling more for Ma Mickey D's, then you know, hey. Hey, you know what? I'm more props to Travis. The only people I feel bad for are anybody that has to work at McDonald's because I know they've been getting yelled at for the last <laughs> two weeks. <laughs> Like, I would quit. Like, I was like, die. if you, like, as soon as I saw somebody, and you know what they look like. I love Travis Scott. I'm a huge Travis Scott fan. Mm -hmm. But the real fans that dress like they are Travis Scott fans, those are the people that are going to McDonald's. And yeah. as soon as they walked in, in their, you know, 
tie-dyed shirts with the holes in it, I'd be like, hey, I <laughs> tie-dyed shirts. I already, I already know what you want. Don't, don't yell at me. Like, don't yell at me. I got your spray right here. I got your burger, all right? Now, yeah. McDonald's, that's a huge company. We got Travis Scott, whatever. Like, that, that's the mediocre, all right? We're talking to you who yeah. you are out here and you're showing all types of food that oh, yeah. is in Houston. And mm -hmm. it's, it's not mediocre. Like, you're showing us, oh. like, oh, all the good spots are, are things like that. Yeah. Now, before we even get to it, before we even get to you starting the blog and everything else, like, okay. were you always into cooking? Like, were you, or was your plan always to be a chef? Um, so yes and no. So um, I think I started cooking when I was very young. My grandmother, I feel like there's a lot of people who start cooking stories. My grandmother, I remember like when I was little, she used to let us use her real pans and me and my sister used to make mud pies, real mud pies in her real pans. Um, and she used to let us take all of them outside. And I guess that, I guess she would wash and stuff later. But that is like literally where I started, like, I guess my culinary journey, like was pretend making mud pies in my grandmother's yard. Um, and then it kind of, as I went through, I, um, I started, I got into, when I went to college, uh, I went on a track scholarship, honestly. So I was around a lot of the athletes or whatever, and they would just come. I mean, I've always been a kind of cool person with everybody. So they would come to my house and I would cook. And then when um, I left college, I was living on the East Coast and people kept on asking me, well, what do you want to do with your life and everything like that? After, um, you know, I was 20. Me too. I mean, I was, you know, out of college and everything. And so I was like, you know what? I'm not going to use this degree that I thought, you know, broadcast journalism. Mm -hmm. I really, that wasn't really what I was feeling with my life. And so I really thought I took some time and I was like, what do you want to do? And I thought back to my grandmother. I thought back to college. I thought back to um, what made me happy. And I was like, this just makes sense. So I'm going to cook. And I literally went to culinary school, uh, well, applied for it that day at the time I was living in Philly. And I went to culinary school in Philly, and I guess the rest is history. So I think innately, when I really stopped to think about it, it always made sense. So yeah, I think a part of me always kind of knew, but I think it just, it, it was that light bulb that clicked at about like 22, living on the East Coast and having a ball. And then, you know, people are like, you got to be responsible. So <laughs> so, yeah. so your initial thing, because it's like you you were developing uh, a website and a food blog and you're going mm -hmm. out and you're highlighting other people's food. And initially that all kind of started where you're, like you said, you enrolled in culinary school. Like you're like, right. I'm just going to go be a chef. How long? First off, how long is culinary school? So it depends. First of all, I am not even... Let me tell you how long I went, okay? <laughs> 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 I went for the first little part, okay? So that was like a year. I think when you do the uh, internship, it turns into like two years. But um, you can be in culinary school like four years. You can get a full like culinary degree. Uh, what I learned very quickly is that you really don't need to spend no money on culinary school and when people ask me hey i'm thinking about culinary school i kind of feel bad but i tell every one of them not to go to culinary school i'm like if you really want to learn if you're that committed like read some books read some culinary books read like what you need to know as far as building a foundation of classical foundation and then go get on somebody's line in your city or even if you want to travel abroad go work in an actual kitchen for free because it's just like school with anything else. It never really prepares you for the outside world. Like you just kind of get tossed out there. You'd be like, all that stuff in the books really didn't help me for this. So <laughs> I just feel like people shouldn't spend their money on going to culinary school. Then you got all this debt and you don't make that much money as a cook starting out. So listen, I'm never going to be an advocate for culinary school, but I am an advocate for people who are passionate about it, learning their craft, honing their skills, and getting on somebody's line and just be, you know, rocking out. So you're saying this is better than just... Didn't you work on a line? I have worked on several lines and quickly figured out that was not the lane for me. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, not? no, it's a hard life 
if, if I'm being like a buck, it's probably one of the hardest jobs you could ever have in your life. Me, I'm a girl. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it's a rough life. Like, um, it's long hours, very strenuous. Chefs are not nice to you just because you're a girl. If you don't know um, what you're doing, they're not going to cut you any slack in that kitchen whatsoever. Uh, and then every kitchen is different. So I was like, you know what? When it came to my actual life as a chef, you know what I'm saying? I was like, what is it that I want to do? What makes me happy and fulfilled? Because I feel like as a chef, you get pushed into so many different spaces. Uh, the second thing I learned was I'm not a caterer either. So really what I have had to do is kind to kind of like literally etch my own way through what makes me feel good, satisfied and fulfilled as far as my purpose. And I feel like, you know, you can be, uh, swayed in different ways from external pressures of this world and I learned as a culinarian that's one thing I was never going to do um yeah I was never going to be able never going to let somebody tell me this is your lane this is your space no I choose what I do and what makes me happy because when I'm happy putting my love and my energy and into the food the food comes out so much better you know what I'm saying and and the experience all together so yeah Wow, you taught me a new word, culinarian. I, culinarian, I, I, yes. I didn't know that. Culinarian. I, so yes. if you're saying like you said the line, working the line, you're like that's not, and that's a hard, hard lifestyle. We have a yeah. Do y'all know what a line is? Because I'm sometimes people use terms and they be like, well, what is that? Well, you know what? what? I, I feel, let, let's explain it for the audience. Yeah, go ahead and explain what, it. What okay. is the line? So the line is the kitchen line. So classically in a kitchen, you have like the chef, the sous chef, the, or excuse me, the chef, the chef de, de cuisine, the sous chef, uh, the grill cook, the uh, fryer cook, the what they call the gar manger, which is like the, the cold station where you get your salads and stuff. Every That's a line. It's like a procession. You know what I'm saying? That's how your food is pushed out classically in a restaurant. Okay, so you have different positions. Um, all of them take prep, you know what I'm saying? You just, people look at it, they get their plate of food and they're like, oh, this is so beautiful. It's so easy. No, people have been, been prepping from that morning to, uh, the time it hits the pan to, uh, staging it just so it's perfectly hot when it comes out to you. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot that goes into it, but that's what, when you're talking about a restaurant and it's specifically when you're talking about like finer dining or like restaurants that are um catered toward the culinary experience um yeah that's that's gonna be your line that's what they call it you know okay. now what part what part of the line were you working or did you work me all parts of the line baby i only made it to garmange which is like it's the french word uh it's like the cold station so like your salads you know some of your cold soups your you know, all that, like your appetizers, all that kind of stuff, That that's that first little part. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like levels to it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I only made it to the first level because your girl, I was like, yeah, this ain't for me. <laughs> like, it's so hard. Um, that's why, like, yeah. And that's why they have such a high turnover rate in the actual restaurant scene. It, mm. um, you know, if you're in the industry, you know, because it gets nuts out there. So, yeah. Cause for Can the you line, say where you was working at? Hmm? Can you say where you was working at? Yeah, it's no longer here. Um, I worked in a couple of restaurants under so some great chefs. Um, Chef Mike Nutt, I worked under him at, it was a place called, um, it's now Bolo. It's right off of Richmond. It's like a Firestone pizza place. But before that, um, it was, a bistro that was like a higher yep. end bistro. It was really nice. Then I worked at Trinity, which was like literally around the corner on Shepherd and Richmond. Yes. It was like a fine dining uh, place with day clothes. And then uh, I worked under Chef Monica Pope at Sparrow, which is, was right next door to the Breakfast Club. Um, yes. So yeah, they all three of them in their prime were like killing it. But you know, um, just in general, like the industry is rough and. Some of them didn't make it or some of them transitioned into other things, you know. So, yeah. I was very fortunate, though, to have, like, a bomb resume for a long time just by working under those three chefs. So, yeah. 
That's awesome. So then after line, what, what made you decide like, okay, so you leave line, uh, mm-hmm. but you're like, I'm not into catering. Like what made you decide no, no for the catering? I did it um, for a long time, uh, especially moving back to Houston. Um, Cause I, 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 at that time you just, it's like with anything, but with this industry, there's so many avenues that you can go down. Um, mm-hmm. And I was really just finding myself, but I always was so uncomfortable with catering. I know um, my friend um, Mika, she's one feisty chef. She always, we actually met at the bistro together. And I've known her like literally my whole culinary career. We've grown together, but she, I asked her, I was like, what do you want to do? She was like, cater. And I knew back then I was like, that's not what I want to do. There's so many moving parts to catering. And I was like, you have to really be passionate about it. So I was like, you know what? That's not my lane. But of course, being young and just getting out of culinary school, you kind of feel obligated when people call you, oh, can you cater for me? You know what I'm saying? Because I could cook, right? I can make food taste good. But I couldn't never get my footing, I felt like, when it came to catering. I would do stuff for, like, my friends Mm -hmm. or, like, you know what I'm saying, my family and stuff like that, more smaller. I always like the intimate uh, things like, you know, like uh, date nights or like private brunches or I always micro catered, you know what I'm saying? I coined that term a long time ago, like uh, 10 or less, you know what I'm saying? So I always was just really into the intimate spaces. But when it came to uh, the bigger spaces, I just never felt comfortable because when I do something, especially when you're handling people's food, you want to do an excellence. And if you can't, to me, then I, I was like, this this is not this might not be for me. And I've always been like that. I've always been the type of person who was able to kind of look at stuff and be self-reflective and be like, you know what? Maybe that's not for me. It you know, um, yeah. Every everything is not for everyone. You know what I mean? And um, I feel like sometimes we kind of get you know know thyself until thyself be true. That is like literally what I live by. And so it just wasn't my it wasn't for me. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it definitely did because it said so. You like you tried the, the line, you're doing fine dining, but you're like, this is just not for me. You move over to the mm-hmm. catering avenue, that's not for you either. So, I what is for like, you? <laughs> yeah, because a lot of people don't know, they're like, okay, so what else is there in the cooking realm that you can get into? So, okay, there's there's a lot of stuff. You can do um you can do food writing, you can do food blogging, you can do um you can do um a lot of people now are pushing when I say food media, there's a lot of different spaces in that because so like you can have like I am a food stylist as well. And I didn't know that that was a thing until uh somebody called me to do it and I was like, oh my God, like this is what I want to do. You know what I mean? Um, but wait, 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 wait. let's stop right there. What's a yeah. what's a food stylist? I know what it sounds like, but what's a food stylist? What are you doing with food stylist? It really is. Really, I just put food on plates and make it look good, honestly. And I get paid for it, which is the best part of it all. Mm-hmm. So, um, bake. That's it. Like literally. I mean, there's there's different techniques to it. I mean, you know. Um, because you really have to learn how to work the camera, which is something I'm developing now as a skill. Um, learning to actually shoot food, which is different than shooting like people. And um, just different techniques and different tricks to making food look really pretty and nice. Um, a lot of the food that you see that's shot, like for magazines or for or for uh, shoot anything, you know, commercials, uh, even on the bags that they have to print, you know, that the food comes in. Those are all styled, food stylists do that. And so I'm like, man, this is a whole new world uh, and a whole new opportunity. And I was like, yeah, this is where I want to be. Yep. Oh, is that why that Travis Scott burger looks like that in the picture? And then you look a little, yes. it looks a little different. Like, that's what everybody complains about. Like, on the picture, it looks like that. And I was like, I think mm-hmm. we're used to this by now. You know it's going to look better. You know right. it's going to look flat when you get you know it. Right. It's going to look better in the picture. Right. Fun fact, though, a lot of the stuff that's styled by stylists, food stylists, are, is in unedible. Like, if you actually ate it, it would make you sick. Take, for example, you got, like, a, a pancake. Like, let's say 
you see the IHOP commercials where you see that perfectly stack of perfect fluffy pancakes and that mm -hmm. uh, dripping uh, syrup that's coming on it and the yeah. uh, perfect butter. First of all, that butter is Crisco, okay? That, that syrup is motor oil. The pancakes have like pins in them to make them stand up and be extra fluffy you know what i'm saying they probably have cardboard in between each piece like you know what i'm saying so no it never looks like that because honestly food itself um anything living and i don't know if <laughs> mcdonald's food be living or not but you know it's always at, at some point you know there's the peak of it and then it starts decaying so you take something uh, you're shooting it under some hot lights for a long time. You actually need to have stuff that sustains itself, like a piece of Crisco versus a piece of butter, which is going to melt as you're, you know, under these hot lights, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, and stuff like that. So there's different stuff. So, yeah, it's not, it's really, it, it's not supposed to look like that because the food that we shoot is actually, you don't want to eat it, will make you sick and and essentially just, like, not be good for you, period. You'll so. die. Mm -mm. Yeah, I didn't want to say that. That's why I was kind of. <laughs> yeah, you kill yourself. That makes, sense. that makes sense, though. That must be yeah. why every Thanksgiving when people post a meal, like you know, it be looking real regular. Like I was like, all these meals, you know, because everybody says every Thanksgiving, like, yo, y'all stop posting plates. Like we all got mm -hmm. the same food. It all looks exactly the same. And yeah. honestly, even when I make my plate, I'm like, I don't want to take a picture of this. Like, it's good, well, but it's yeah. not gonna do my mom justice. Like. It's, yeah. This is really, really good. But, you know, it ain't, it don't look like it's Most, on the cover of Food Magazine. Hey, you don't want that. Do you know that 90, probably 95% of turkeys that are shot for a Thanksgiving spread when it comes to food styling are raw? Like, you literally cook it. I just did a food shoot uh, where I did for Thanksgiving a few uh, months ago. And I, like you take the turkey and you cook it for 15 minutes just to get the the meat the skin tight and then you brush it with um with uh what is that stuff called browning you brush it with browning wow. yeah so oh, it's so inedible that 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 shot where they're cutting into the thanksgiving that's just raw raw turkey They'll 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 cook that part. So they'll 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 cut it, bake it. You know what I'm saying? Leave it open and stuff like that. And then so when you see that nicely cut, you know, turkey slice, then they'll have cooked that part. But yeah, there's tips and tricks and techniques to it all. But most of those turkeys are raw. <laughs> Yo, the lies you tell. What you what you talking? I can't believe this. Yeah. I thought that was real. Mm -hmm. A lot of, um, let's see what else. Uh, when you, um, a lot of ice cream, most of that is Crisco. Most of all of that is Crisco. Really? Um, that what makes else? sense because ice cream's going to melt. So my Ice cream's going to melt. Um, another one that blew my mind was like, if you have foam on stuff, that's like soap. You know what I'm saying? So if you got get a Sprite um, commercial, you see the fizz coming off of that, that's Alka-Seltzer. You know, um, it's just a lot of little techniques and little tricks that people don't even realize. Like, you don't want that food ever. So. Uh, mm -hmm. See, I feel like I'm about it again. Three o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. on the infomercials. Whew. On the what commercials? On the oh. infomercials and stuff like that. Stuff be looking so good. But thank you. You've ruined yeah. it for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it's so funny. I wasn't even thinking about being really a food stylist. Um, cause honestly, my, I don't have the natural hand for it. I think naturally, like I wanted to put a whole bunch of, uh oh, uh oh, oh where y'all at? Good. Okay. Sorry. I got a, I got a call. Naturally, I wanted to be, um, put a whole bunch of stuff on a plate. But what I realized when you style food, and this is even for your mom's food for this Thanksgiving, what you should try to do if you want to take that beautiful plate of food and actually make it something, you know, you feel like is worthy. What you should do is take a small plate, right? Most, most plates that are shot are small. People think 
well, I want to eat all this. You know what I'm saying? Even when I'm plating for someone and I want to plate it cute, I say, you know what? I'm going to plate this. And if you want more afterwards, then I'll fix you more on your plate. But you always, less is more when it comes to plating. So you take two slices of your mom's turkey real nice you layer them on top of each other you know what i'm saying you nestle a little corn you know a little string beans get like if you want to make it real nice you take a scoop scoop out some of the dressing you know put it on there you know put your little um what's that stuff uh cranberry sauce around there get you a sprig of you know, whatever you want, but rosemary, dress it on there, you know, drape it on there. You know what I'm saying? So if you really want it to look, you know, nice instead of like, oh, uh, shoot, this is what I'm eating. Because you don't eat plated food like that. So the the place that you see there, it's just, it's for aesthetics. You know what I'm oh, okay. saying? Okay. Really. Yeah. Now, you're talking about like uh, the food photography and food styling for like these campaigns. How does yeah. that stuff apply to uh like what you're doing with your blog like when you have the blog you're out mm -hmm. there you're looking at food and the food that you have there looks incredible uh we'll show you guys pictures of the blog in a minute but it is one of those things where it's like i know y'all aren't you're not going out and getting crisco like you have to be ready uh for a lot of right this stuff. right so there are still um even a lot of techniques when it comes to food i think that um, when I'm out and I'm doing, um, when I'm shooting for like a restaurant, let's say somebody invites me out, hey, I want you to come here. I'm really just there to cover it. You know what I'm saying? So I'll make sure like even at restaurants, I'll go and I'll go towards the natural light or I'll ask to sit by the natural light. So if they're like, hey, where do you want to sit? I'm always looking for, okay, where is the light shining in the sunlight because sunlight is going to be your best light for food you know what i'm saying so i always try to sit near somewhere where the sun is coming in very nicely you know what i'm saying um what else i only shot if you look at my pictures most of them are tight shots you know what i'm saying unless i do like an overhead or aerial shot most of them are really getting into the food i'll take one piece and highlight it as opposed to like the whole plate of something because the rest of the plate might actually might not look good you know what i mean mm -hmm. but i'm like okay this does you know and it just comes with time honestly um or like even if they bring out they'll bring out a couple of different plates i will actually style the plates how i want them to take an overhead shot or i might lift up a plate or place the food in different angles on the plate when they bring it to me so it just it really just depends oh so you'll have to like sometimes fix up the plate for, oh yeah has the oh, chef yeah. ever been like nah it's good <laughs> No, most chefs are too busy. Uh, most chefs, you know what I'm saying, they'll come in the after uh, after you eat and mm. be like, well, how was it and stuff like that. But most of them, no. I will, I have sent food back because it wasn't like, if I'm there to actually cover you and I'm working, then if something comes out, I'm like, hey, this is, hey, can we do this? Can we change this? Can we do this? You know what I'm saying? And replay it. Um, also, I will ask what's the most, like, so if I'm ordering, if I'm working and I'm ordering, I'm going to ask them, what's the prettiest drink that you have? You know what I'm saying? I also ask, is it the strongest? <laughs> but, you know, what I'm saying? hopefully the two can the two can come together. But you know, um, yeah, I ask them. You know, straight up, like, what's your prettiest drink? Because people love to see beautiful things, especially when they eat. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So, I mean, I guess that kind of goes into with food blogging, and I guess food critiquing. I wouldn't mm -hmm. say yours is like you really highlight a lot of places that you want to go to. Mm -hmm. I don't see a lot on your page. I don't see anything on your page where you're like, oh, this place was trash. I don't like it. Mm -hmm. Like that kind of thing. No, I get some heat for that though. Like I do. Like people, I've had a couple of people, um, and this is why it's really important in the food industry to be consistent. I'll go somewhere and I'm like, hey, get this, this, and this. And they'll go and they're like, mm, well, most of the time they didn't get what I told them to get. That's what I've learned. <laughs> like they didn't beard off. You at a Mexican place and you get like chicken salad. It's like, okay, well, what did you expect? You know what I mean? <laughs> um, but a lot of times, um, you know what I mean? Like, 
it's really just about me showing people what's out there. So I'm not a critic. There, I have a chef friend of mine, Chef Willie. He loves to critique, break down, uh, dissect the pit. All the, I'm like, I'm not here for that. I'm here to tell people this is here. If you would like to try it, this was what I had, and it was delicious. You know what I'm saying? And if it's not delicious, what I do, especially because I work with a lot of Black-owned restaurants, I'll pull them to the side and say, hey, this was not that great. Um, that reminds me now, I got to have a conversation with somebody <laughs> right now. I'm like, oh, shoot, you know. But, uh, I, you know, I, I try to handle things delicately because one thing that I know, especially in these times of COVID, is that um, – everybody's out here just trying to survive and I hope to put out the best food they possibly can. So if they fall short on something, I don't think it's intentional. And so um, because I'm not a critiquer, I'm able to have a place where people do trust me to come out. And if they know if I see something or, or something is off or whatever, I'll pull them to the side and I say, Hey, you know, because I really want you to see you win. Like, this is what I thought about, you know, my experience. So. Yeah. Because I was going to say, uh, there's, uh, we, we had you on a, a lot of times. I like that you were featuring so many uh, Black-owned restaurants here in Houston. Uh, yeah. And it's a very positive look. There was a, he passed away. I just forgot his name. There was a famous critic that was out of Los Angeles. And a okay. lot of restaurants cite him for building up their business. And they were just kind of like, you knew he liked your stuff. If he came in, he ate your food. And then he wrote about it. If mm -hmm. he didn't like it, he just didn't write about it. And he was like, yo, I got all my life to, you know, critique and all, like, if I mm -hmm. wanted to. But he's like, I would much rather, and they had this one woman that was, uh, I think it was, on, it was on, on a Netflix special. She was literally just crying, talking about this guy showed my restaurant in, like, a positive light. I don't know if people would have been coming here if it wasn't for him. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's right. a big thing. And I see you doing a lot of the same stuff, especially with, uh, look, there's no getting around it. There's a rise in restaurant coverage by TikTokers and Instagram and YouTube and stuff like that. And most of these places, they're not black. Like they, they always right. wind up in places that aren't black and you really focus on that. So what kind of kept you, uh, one, in Houston, focused on Houston okay. restaurants. What is it about the Houston scene? And what is it about uh, Black restaurants in the Houston scene that you wanted to highlight? Um, well, I, like you said, I've um, eaten at so many uh, restaurants, especially when I first started blogging, which is something I actually got into um, by accident. Like, honestly, I had uh, uh, somebody, a friend of mine had invited me to the... Um, the Houston Food Bloggers Collective, when it first started, like their first meeting, they're like, hey, you wanna roll? I'm like, I mean, okay. You know what I'm saying? And literally met people and the the journey just kind of happened from there. But um, I think that, I don't know. I, I, I think that there's so much that we have to offer in the black community and I feel like if I have a platform, I'm always cheerlead the people who are doing their best, especially in the culinary scene um, that are my people. I mean, I always felt, uh, I can talk about a whole bunch of different restaurants, but I feel like especially, especially during COVID, like you see how um, big corporations have opened their doors to restaurants to come in and, you know, house some of their stuff, mm -hmm. but you see who gets picked versus mm -hmm. people who don't, you know what I'm saying? So I'm like, every voice counts. And because I have a following, which I thank God for, um, I literally was talking to a friend. I'm like, I don't even know why all these people follow me, but you know what I'm saying? I'm really grateful. I'm just out here doing me and people like it. And that's like literally my spiel, you know? Um, but, uh, you know, I, I just, I think there's so many hard workers, like, you know, and then um, I had started a uh, tour actually called Nam Noir, literally my first tour that I was going to do. People had bought tickets and everything was for the like the day it that was the day of, it was the day of covid i remember that i was like whoa yeah yes and so 
um I literally started because I'm like, man, there's so many tours in Houston. There's so many things in Houston for people to do. I said, but nobody's really championing black excellence in the culinary scene. And because I mentioned before, that's one of the hardest industries. It is one of the hardest industries, period. Mm -hmm. We need to be championing, championing each other in these spaces. Also, I realized from talking to a lot of other um, black owned uh, restaurant tours and stuff like that they don't know each other and I was like there needs to be some sense of community within this community because contrary to popular belief I mean I don't even know if it's popular belief I just didn't realize that a lot of them know of each other but and it's not even the lack of support it's that they're so busy they just hadn't had a chance to go check taste this or yeah. taste that or take you know what i'm saying so i'm like man whatever i can do on this platform i'm going to do um and so yeah now, that's, that's interesting because i mean the restaurant community it just seems like from what you see on tv and things like that it's such a a tight-knit community where they're like mm -hmm. oh like this chef goes to this spot and this chef goes here and this mm -hmm. bartender goes over here and things like that. So it's interesting mm -hmm. you say where it's like, you know, a lot of the black restaurants, they're so busy and they're working that they don't get a chance to say, hey, like, I, I need to go check out this spot or I need this or I need that. And yeah. so, yeah, yeah, I've never seen that aspect before. Yeah, I started a, um, like a little, it's just a mini series. Um, again, I started that with um, my culinary tour and just, I mean, COVID has hit like in different ways, but yeah. um, honestly, I'm gearing it back up where I'm actually uh, interviewing black chefs. But what I do is we actually sit down and we talk. Like I want to check in with everybody because I'm like, man, y'all are like killing it out here. You know what I mean? Um, through all this. But what I have them do is I, ha I bring them a meal because they're always feeding. And a lot of and the biggest misconception about chefs is that they eat well, but a lot of them work so hard and get off so late. They really eat just a lot of fast, quick, whatever they can find things. Um, right, and so... Yeah, and so I said, you know what, I'm going to feed them. So what I wanted to do was take um, food from another Black-owned restaurant and us break bread while we're talking and so that they get a chance to experience another Black restaurant's food because a lot of times you just don't have time or they just haven't made it over or whatever. So, yeah. Ah, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh and then just in terms of Houston, what is it about uh, the Houston restaurant scene that, you, I, I mean, it, do you feel like you, I, I, there's a, oh, what is that show on Netflix? The Chef Show? Is it The Chef Show? I don't know. What, one of there's them. a bunch of them there's on Netflix. There's a few. Wow. There's one where the guy uh, basically said, uh, it's an Asian guy. Uh, he was like, I think that Houston is the culinary capital of the world. Is and that Jason Chang? Yes. Okay. Yes, that was him. And I mean, I thought the show was interesting. One, because it did highlight some aspects of Houston when they were doing like the V8, the V8 Cajun, v Cajun yeah. Which, you know, that's a, that's a thing. A controversial a beautiful topic. thing. You know, I love it, but depending on who you ask, uh, and wait, let's not say I love it. I love the idea that you get this mixing. I still prefer mm -hmm. old school crawfish. Like okay. I prefer Cajun, just straight up crawfish, but uh -huh. I like mixes of everything. But what are your thoughts <laughs> on Houston being this culinary capital? I think it's the truth. I literally, I, like I had friends in this weekend, they're from the East Coast. They're actually from Philly where I, um, where I uh, went to culinary school mm -hmm. and I was talking to them about Houston and Houston's food. They, I think a lot of other places, especially like on the East Coast and stuff, they 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 focus on like execution. So you're going to get five-star Michelin restaurants, right? Which Houston doesn't have a lot of, but what we have is a lot of diversity. We have a lot of uh, ingenuity. We have um, a lot of um, fusion. So like, the V occasion, for example, that's fusion. You know what I'm saying? We have a lot of people who can play within different spaces. Not only that, we have a large selection of seafood, uh, beef, you know what I'm saying? And produce. So when you have those things that are coming fresh, we got the, you know, stuff from the Gulf. We got the, you know, beef, 
um, you know what I'm saying, from the cattle that roam Texas. And then we also have a lot of cultural diversity. You think of the different pockets you go to around Hillcroft. You have like the Middle Eastern and that kind of, you know, the Indian, you can get your spices and stuff like that from around there. You go to um, Chinatown right you have little pockets um of people who are from mexico and from um the spanish com countries you know what i mean you have black people you have white people you have i met a guy he was uh polish he told me where i can go get you know polish eats and stuff like that so it's just it's such a melting pot um or you know what it's more like a gumbo let's just be honest okay since we in the south we got a gumbo going on around here and i think it's a beautiful thing because i think you could just play with some that I was playing with a recipe today or some uh project that I have going on. I'm like, oh, this is bomb. But I literally took like two things and I merged them together. And so um, yeah, if we focus on food that tastes good. For me, if you put a plate in front of me and you say, Would you rather have something that was well executed or a plate that tastes good that I want to eat? I'm gonna always pick the place that tastes the best. So okay. mm -hmm. Now, the other thing, too, is, all right, I'm going to put you on the spot because you got the food blog, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, people come into town all the time, and they say, hey, where do I need to go? And I'm not going right. to, not to disparage anybody. There usually mm -hmm. be, like, the same three places. Like, they'd be like, stop here, here, and here. That's Houston. Okay. Uh, I'll let the listeners figure out or just throw out their guesses. I know a couple of names is getting thrown out, but for you, if somebody mm -hmm. is coming in town, they're like, look, mm -hmm. I'm in town for a week. Okay. Tell me where I need to go. What do I need to go? What do I need to eat? What do I need to see? Okay. Where you need to go? Um, I say to experience Houston. I feel like you have to go to Third Ward. I feel like that is like, you have to go to Third Ward. And not only that, you have to like, because some, I mean, third war, unless you know where you're going, you know what I'm saying? But find those pockets, do the research on the history because it's so rich. You know what I'm saying? So third ward, um, I think is a place that you have to go. Um, but also, of course, people would say the Galleria. You know what I mean? Okay, cool. You know what I mean? <laughs> that was one. But you can get a ball anywhere. You know what I'm saying? So for me, it depends on the person, but I like that history, that, that history, historical aspect. Okay, um, where to go? You said what to see. Um, you know, I think you should see. Um, I don't know in Houston what you should see because what I'm gonna tell them go to Galveston. Yeah. <laughs> um, really I don't know. Uh, I don't know what you know what on Allen Parkway, right before you get to 45. I think that's the most like beautiful scene of like downtown so I think that I would tell them you know what I'm saying go and see that if you want a great picture aesthetically of the city um you know because when I think of somewhere I want to have like these memories and I want to take pictures um so that would be a great place to go take a picture so I feel like that's something you have to see um and then also where to eat so my top three places um, if you want barbecue, there's two places. I got to plug a black one, so I'm going to say Ray's Barbecue. Of right course. on Wallace City. You knew it. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I, 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 and you're, and, and you're, not, you're not wrong. You're yeah. not wrong. Right. That's good. Yeah. I'm going to say Ray's because, simply because they're bomb, and they've they just are. done stuff so well. Yes. But you know what? I honestly judge barbecue on the side. Like, that's how I judge a barbecue place on their side what? because what, yeah, when you come to brisk, like for me, or or the brisket, because okay. that can also okay. be a, okay, yeah, that it's like the size of brisket because brisket done well is 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 very sometimes mm -hmm. hard for people. So, um, really? but yeah, I'm gonna say raise for I feel like across the board, they're bomb. Um, and then also the pit room, I, I, I mean, you know, they're not black on, but they are they're solid. Um, okay. okay. Yeah, that's right off of Richmond. If you want barbecue, um, I'm also plug classically. Y'all know I have to plug Papados. Like I, I mean, yeah. you have they to can, go there. The pop they consistently do what they need to do. Like that's and it. that's 
And that that's it. Is, it's consistent. That's what it is. That's what it's yeah. about. It's a solid plate of food done well. And, you know, we are spoiled by it, but coming into tech, Houston, if you want, because you got to give them seafood on, on some level. So where else you going to take them? You know yeah. what I'm saying? I'm like, no, nah, we're going to pop those. Um, and then um, my favorite restaurant in Houston is called Nobis. Um, it's on off of Shepherd. And it's a, a husband and wife duo and they just put out some really banging food like they do fusions of all types south african american spanish like they just take it to another level he's a uh, a classically trained um chef and she's a pastry chef and they just do some bomb food so yeah um those really? would be my top top places oh, okay okay Okay, mm-hmm. so, uh, and you were just giving us out advice on, uh, you know, the top places, the places to go. Let's talk about the website, uh, the, fat, the Fat Girl Food The Chron- Fat Girl Food Chronicles. Yeah. Actually, I just rebranded, though, like, to the Queen of Yum. I just haven't changed my website and stuff like that. Um, but, I mean, yeah, um, I'm still under the Fat Girl Food Chronicles because I was the Fat Girl Food Chronicles chronicles for so long yeah. and it was um a beautiful time in my life um it was so necessary in my journey um but yeah so yeah that's me so, <laughs> fat girl food chronicles uh, the Go fat girl food chronicles yeah, yeah. yeah and as far as the website i have to post more more of my stuff is on instagram so i'm more of a micro blogger you know what i'm saying i put a lot of stuff on instagram but i also of course have the fat girl food chronicles.com uh mm-hmm. that is gonna soon be changed to the queen of yum um so yeah in the process of rebranding just for some next moves okay you know what i mean okay. mm-hmm. and then you also have like you were saying nam noir Yes. And tell us about Nam Noir again, just for uh, people. Yes, Nam Noir is, um, like I said, it's a actual, it's a it's a um, cultural diversion, a diversity and inclusion immersion through food. So basically, it is um, when corporations or just anyone wants to get a feel of the culture through food they can come to our tour it's housed in third ward like i said because third ward is to me the epicenter of um the black community in houston it represents um i mean some people might say fifth ward i just i think that uh third ward is more central and it has a lot the history is just there still you know what i'm saying like you have project row house you have tsu you have um beyonce's old house you have you know uh mcgregor park you have you know what i'm saying so there's there's a lot of tangible things that are still there you still have the uh black uh hospital nursing hospital that's oh, still there yeah, absolutely is beyonce's yeah. old house on the tour yeah it is oh okay okay you know, mm-hmm. everything so i do I mean, uh, people can find you uh, on that Instagram site for Nam Noir. I mean, yep. how do restaurants or other people that want to participate, how do they get involved? Well, honestly, I handpicked the uh, restaurants. Okay. Um, and, of course, this was pre-COVID. So um, I just, most of them right now, now, I feel like it's selfish for me to go in and hey, be like, hey, you know, we got to start this tour back when I know that a lot of people are just still trying to like get their footing. Um, even though it's been a while, it's like, you know, that if we, I went out to eat, speaking of Papados, I went out to eat at Papados, which is one of the bigger chains in, in Houston. And they still haven't even started their happy hour again. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They've closed X amount of restaurants. So, it hit people hard and to go in and to ask them, hey, this is what I was thinking on this type of budget. I feel like really isn't, uh, be, it, it really would be tone deaf at this point. Mm-hmm. So um, because it is, so what, what we do is we have a historical tour of Third Ward, but we stop at five different restaurants along the tour and at every restaurant with your ticket, you get to try food plated by the chef. So um, yeah. Uh, we so yeah, that's what it is. But um, it'll start back. Um, like I said, when everything kind of shakes out. But right now, what I'm doing is using the platform to highlight um different um black-owned 
uh, culinary treats, eats, and everything like that. Um, and so, and it's not just specific to Third Ward anymore because I was like, well, through these trying times, I want to support everyone. So yeah. I try to post on there as much as possible to make sure that people are knowing what's out there. Um, and so that they can also, um, you know, champion these people because it's not easy. Um and, you know, I want people to really support, you know, especially Black-owned places, because a lot of us are, you got the single, you know, business. A lot of them aren't franchised out, or a lot of them aren't, you know what I'm saying, um, at that place of, you know, I want them to be able to scale. For me, uh, when I look at the Black community and when it comes to restaurants, I want people to be able to scale their businesses for wealth, you know what I'm saying, and for... Mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to succeed, so. Mm -hmm. So I guess even on that point, I mean, and we talk about supporting Black businesses, but we also hear, you know, amongst our community, like, you know, I tried and they just da-da-da-da-da. I've covered mm -hmm. businesses and it's been the same thing. What is some advice that you would give to uh, people that are going out to support uh, Black businesses? What's the best way they can do it? And then I got another follow-up after that. Okay. I think the best way to support Black businesses is to support them like you support the white businesses. <laughs> like, um, I think that when you go somewhere and it's not a person of color running it, I think that you need to be a little... Um, not even forgiving is the word, but you need to really think if this was X place, would I give them a second chance, right? Mm -hmm. Or if this was this other place or these were these other people, would I go on Yelp and write them a horrible review because I had a hair in my food? Because I think fairness across the board, you know what I mean? Um, if I go to somewhere and I have a bad experience, do I treat them the same? Or am I really um, accepting the narrative that uh, I expected them? You know what I'm saying? Their expectations. Some people have some people's expectations are off, you know what I'm saying? Like, when you go into one establishment, your expectation is for it to be great, but if it's not, you don't bash them, and you know what I'm saying? Be 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 open, and this is just not for the, the patron. This is also for the people who are providing the services. Be open to criticism, you know what I'm saying? Um, I, I've learned that people are fighting so hard uh, to just stay afloat, that they miss some things. Customer service is a big one. If you look at the models who have great customer service, it matters. Even with small businesses, those little extras go a long way. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then um, on the other end, as a patron, don't take advantage of those small extras. You know what I'm saying? Don't come in, eat a half a plate of food, and and be like, I don't like it. If you don't like it at the beginning, tell that person because they're already taking an L on the plate that you don't want anyway. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Be respectful. You know what I mean? Um, and if there is a problem, you don't have to be disrespectful. And this is from both sides. Don't just use some respect to realize that you guys are working together. The person comes in to eat just like the person comes in to cook and to serve and to greet you know what I'm saying so um you know there just has to be a level of respect that you give in all spaces um I feel like uh some people are just more lenient or some people just go into places expecting it to be less than then the other part and this is what I'm a huge advocate of holding people accountable we cannot keep saying because it's a small business because it's a black owned business that we can let a whole bunch of stuff slide there has to be a standard of excellence just like there is in other places you know what i mean um you can't and, and also the other the other thing is besides that um being consistent like you said about Papa Do's. people can say what they want about Papa Do's, whether they love or hate them pound for pound they're consistent yeah. you know what I'm saying yeah. and when people especially our people come in 
they want the same thing they had the very first time and they want it done just as good because trust and believe if it is good and it is consistent you will have repeat business and that's what's going to keep you in business in the restaurant you know in the restaurant field so oh absolutely mm -hmm. that actually answered both because i was going to ask you what comes from the restaurant side as well but mm -hmm. that, that handles both and that consistency yeah. goes a long way because yeah there are plenty of restaurants where people be like oh i don't know how they just stay open and i was like they've been providing the same type of food consistently for like 30 years yeah. like you might not like it no more maybe you never liked it but when you go in here you're always going to get that plate as opposed yeah. to certain restaurants where you're like yo i went in there and it was great and then I went in there, and you know, there are certain places where we're like, well, don't go there on Friday because you know how I go on Friday. But if you yep. hit them on a Tuesday when nobody's there, oh, it's fire. And I was like, I don't got time yep. for that. I yep. don't got time for that at all, you know? And that's and that's just, yeah, that's what it, just what it is. You know what I mean? Like, um, I, I went into a place uh, and, and having a hard conversation as a blogger, I'm not coming into your place and I'm not seeing something and not going to pull you to the side and say something we literally have a, a, I think on a certain level because there's it, it has a lot of moving parts but I think on a certain level we have expected okay this is gonna be a black owned business we gonna have to wait a long time there's gonna be a black owned restaurant uh your food might not be you know he might get a big piece of fish he might get a small piece of fish or you know what I'm saying or you know there's different things I feel like we've accepted but we have to keep hold, hold people accountable in love though you yeah. know what i'm saying because these people are you know doing their best and what i have learned <laughs> a lot of these people are not have not been taught business right okay. i think the biggest thing that kills black businesses that i have seen is emotion and we have got to learn to do business uh, either aside or with or through emotion black mm -hmm. people are such passionate people and we and that is one of the most beautiful things about us but we have to learn to be diplomatic when it comes to business a stop doing sketchy business sometimes and i'm not gonna say all because i know some excellent business people out here that yeah. are doing stuff keep your stuff in order you know what I'm saying? Get you a CPA. Get you an LLC. You know what I'm saying? Make sure you have crossed your T's and dotted your I's. And it might take you longer because that kind of stuff does take money. You know what I'm saying? But sometimes it matters. A lot of people weren't qualified for those SBA loans because they didn't have their money in order. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? They they Their books weren't right. You were paying this person, this person under the table. Then when it came to applying, it's like, well, how many employees you got? And it's like, oh, okay. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it matters. I think it's better to start, and I've seen, I could count on my, like, I, I think it's better to start small and scale up then start big and have to work your way down because you mm. bit off more than you can chew. Yeah. Start some, if you have a menu with three bomb items, like learn from the people who are successful. Chick-fil-A don't do all of this and all of that and your grandma this and your that. Start with something you do very well. Miko's Hot Chicken got what? Three items and they all were yeah. hot chicken. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? McDonald's. What they start off with? Burgers. Mm -hmm. That's all they did. Burgers, shakes, and fries. That's it. Chick fil A. What you get in there? Chicken. You, you look at the people who are successful and stop trying to think that, you know what I'm saying? It's nothing wrong with scaling up, but do something small and excellent and then grow. You was, know what I mean? I was even looking at, uh, I, I tried out the, the Yo Yo's hot dog guy, and I was surprised mm -hmm. that there's not a menu. Like, you just walk up and say how many hot dogs you want. It's like, it's all the same thing. And it's one of those things where it's like, I'm serving the same thing over and over again, but you see gradually that's getting me the success. Like, when he sets up that cart, and when I tell you, dude has a cart, not a truck, not yep. anything, he has a cart in a parking lot and a line that goes for blocks. But it is what it is. He's like, yo, I, I'm serving the same hot dog every single time. And I'm going to say, I'm going to serve this same hot dog maybe 4,000 times tonight. But that's what you're getting. Yeah. Right. And that's like with me, I people have been asking me, for, are you starting something? I said, all right. 
I'm going to do something that I, I said, what is the best thing you cook? Not the best thing you cook, but what is something you cook very, very, very well that is going to be, that people love, that's not going to be like some crazy venture or whatever. I was like, I do these pastas real good. What you going to get? Well, starting out is three pastas, okay? Mm-hmm. I just literally worked on my vegan pasta today. I'm like, because I want to get a be- vegan something that can really, I want to show love to the vegan. Yeah. So I sit and I worked on my recipe today. I'm like, okay, I need to do this. I need to tweak this. But I'm going to show love to the vegans. And I got two of the pasta. That's it. That's all you're getting. Because those are going to smack. And then I can scale up from there. That's it. Okay. You know what I'm saying? I think um, I think sometimes we think about this idea of grandeur. You know what I'm saying? There's nothing wrong with that. Because you're going to win if you work in excellence. Period. I've never seen somebody who hasn't perfected their craft that is not doing what they need to do and getting that bread that they need to get. Because people are going to come to you if you have a solid product, especially when it comes to food. You have a solid, consistent product. You're gonna win. Period. Well, look, man, where where can the people? I, I, that was such a good note to leave off of because that's not uh-huh. just that doesn't just apply to food. That applies to life. That applies to pretty much yeah. any venture you're working on. Find something mm-hmm. you're at and do it well to perfection. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Where can the people find you? Just say all of your stuff real quick. Again, just okay. so people know. All right. Um, you can find me at the Queen of Yum. Um, you can find me at the Queen of Yum on Instagram. You can find me um, on the thefatgirlfoodgrandicles.com. And you can find me, um, sorry, I just, sorry, let me start over. Can I start over? I'm sorry. Yes, absolutely. Something, right. something, just, something just happened, um, yeah. and I didn't mean to. Okay, you can, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> sorry. You can find me at the Queen of Yum on Instagram. Um, okay. You can find me at Nam Noir, and that's, uh, you won't see my face, but just know it's me, champion these Black-owned restaurants. Um, so you can find me there. At Nam Noir, and of course at the Fat Girl Food Chronicles. That's T H A F A T. Um, the Fat Girl Food Chronicles dot com, of course. And I got this new pasta venture coming out. I'll drop it on the uh, Queen of Yum site and the Fat Girl Food Chronicles. And uh, yeah. All right, all right. Well, look, we appreciate you coming out. Uh, Thank you. And, and just letting us know everything that's going on with you uh i mean sure. thank you guys and like i'm so excited to uh meet new people that are doing like really cool stuff mm-hmm. you know what i mean especially with y'all's uh podcast like this is this is dope hey man that, let, let people know pump it up or you know save us some pasta you know no mm-hmm. i'll pay for yeah. pasta no we'll no 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 pasta. y'all can come yeah, out we'll pay. With- Hey, I'm for doing okay. a, I'm doing a- no, because I also want to make sure people are supporting. You know, people be like, "Oh, let me get it." No, support no, your people. No, 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 no. Yeah. I'm having a pop up. I literally called the venue today, and I'm like, "Hey, I'm doing a pop up because I'm gonna do this." I think my word this year, not even I think my word this year was consistency. And if I don't do nothing else this year, I'm gonna be consistent in something. Okay, yeah. um, because as a creative, you can get, you can get, you know, your creations can go here, there, and everywhere. But I say, you know what? Now nah, I'm gonna be consistent so yeah y'all will see that pasta pull up on me because your girl will be selling selling that pasta okay? <laughs> we'll pull up for the pasta. We'll we will definitely pull up for the pasta good good, good. thanks a lot mm-hmm. once again this is yeah. my humble opinion podcast i've been one of your hosts avery like a very nice guy also here with my brother just devon boom hey and we're coming out with the queen of yum the Fat Girl Food Chronicles, Vicky V, Chef Vicky V. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank opinion. you, guys. Thank you. In my humble opinion, where the words are, aren't jumbled, I just jumble the words. I can't start over. But man, in my humble opinion, where the words aren't jumbled and the opinions are humble. You have a great, wonderful day. Thank you and good night. Bang.